Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Resident Evil Code Veronica X. In the last part, we properly got started on Chris's section of the game in Rockport Island, doing quite a bit across the military training facility in the process. And now that we have the tank model, it's time for us to head back to the first floor of the training facility in order to go visit the painting room once again. For ultimately, one of my least favorite parts of the game in terms of the you've got to be kidding me factor. More on that in a moment. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the rooms in the military training facility don't get zombies until later on, if at all. Just be careful of the Seekers once again, though, like I stated last time, as long as you're not directly in their line of sight that's indicated by that little cone, you don't need to worry about them spawning a hunter. And welcome back here. Now that we have the tank model, we can put it in that spot here in the diorama that I didn't show off when we first entered this room as Claire. And that's going to reveal that behind the painting. How we didn't hear the electric whizzing behind that, I don't know. Maybe it's soundproofed. The main thing we want to do this for is the turntable keys. This allows us to do something back at the other floor. But there's also a file here. Secret passage note. The underground passage which leads to the mansion where Alexia and I live has been badly damaged. Although I can never allow the unwashed to see Alexia, I cannot go on using the underground waterway that those local people made either. Oh yes, I think I'll have those prisoners build a bridge. It must be a gorgeous bridge that befits the perfection that is Alexia. Of course, I must kill everyone who's involved in the construction of the bridge after it's done, so that no one will know about the existence of our mansion. But that is okay, as I have no problem executing such matters. Once the bridge is completed, I'll seal the mansion entrance door at the, uh, at the end of the underground waterway. The entrance of the waterway is locked by the diorama trick, ensuring the secrecy of our mansion, Alfred Ashford. And something's written beside the hole. Lead three armies here, that, and the path will open. You, your first thought for what you need to go there is completely right. We need to make our way back towards where the Hercules plane took off from at the end of disc one and grab the proofs we spent the entire first half of the game collecting to bring them over here. So that's another step in the way. Now I figured this is probably a good point to continue on reading the Wesker reports as we started that a couple parts ago. Where we last left off was the very end of Resident Evil 1, so let's start off in September. Two months had passed since the mansion incident. To regain everything that I had lost in my new organization, I joined hands with Ada Wong, a female agent who was also sent to spy on Umbrella. I knew in my bones that the key developer was William Birkin, but what he didn't know was that Umbrella did not play games with anyone. Eventually, Birkin would be assassinated and the G-Virus would be in the hands of Umbrella. But the salvage team led by Hunk was ahead of us. By the time they got to Birkin, he'd already injected himself with the G-Virus. He became his own creation and decimated them. Soon after, the T-Virus carried by rats spread throughout Raccoon City and Umbrella faced its worst scenario. September 28th, the good citizens became zombies and the city had headed down had headed for its devastating fate. Humans were no match against zombies, even though clearly these games prove that that's not exactly true, but oh well. In the chaos, Umbrella Europe applied a new type of B.O.W. called Nemesis. The Nemesis would hunt down and destroy the surviving STARS member, Jill. It became imperative that our organization would also obtain the Nemesis data. September 29th. To cover up the whole affair, Umbrella jettisoned a tyrant to take care of Leon and Claire, who were trying to unveil their secrets. Then a new revelation. Birkin used to hide the findings of his studies in his daughter Sherry's pendant. It was very possible that the G-Virus was there, while Umbrella was busy with their cover-up. We had to capture Sherry before they did. I sent Ada undercover to seek the location of Sherry. I, the dead man, on the other hand, had to work in the shadows. A spy's obligation and priority is in the mission, to carry out the mission like a machine without any emotional interference. But through her interaction involvement with Leon S. Kennedy, there has been an affection growing inside her. My instincts sense danger. Something had to be done quickly. My instincts did not disappoint me, even though Ada almost had her hands on the G-Virus which Leon had acquired, acquired from Sherry. That affection of hers drove her to her death. But she was still of some use. I had to save her life. My people hurried to retrieve the G-Virus that Leon threw away. But Hunk, the only survivor of Umbrella's salvage team, was there before us. September 30th. Our only option left was to bring back Birkin, the monster, as the sample specimen and have him finish off Leon and Claire in order to obtain his combat data. Although Birkin lost the battle to Leon and Claire, we succeeded in gathering samples of the G-Virus from his dead body. October 1st. In the morning, the government bombed Raccoon City in an attempt to first stop further viral outbreak. This was, of course, their feigned reason. Later, Claire left for Europe to find her lost brother Chris, and Leon joined forces with an underground anti-Umbrella organization. Sherry is safe in our hands. I would never underestimate Birkin. There's something about this little girl. 
And that was originally going to carry off into a different version of Resident Evil 4, I believe, than we ended up getting. I think one of the earlier castle variants of the game, from memory. As I believe I mentioned when I started reading that, there is a separate fan translation that's technically a little more accurate, even though it just lacks some of the characterization of Wesker. And I think they also redid the Wesker report for the HG remaster to kind of get rid of the hanging thread of Sherry being captured. Uh, I think it goes along the lines of something like, there's something hidden within Sherry, we're just not sure what. By and large, the Wesker report is slightly dated in its canonicity, at least with how they refer to certain events, but it's still overall canon. Uh, they, they'd also later do a second Wesker's report, which was done in the lead-up to Remake, and I believe that one's still considered canon as well. With that said, uh, now, since we have the turntable key, we can head back to where we first encountered the Hunters, and grab the shotgun along the way, because we're not need to need to- we're not going to need to use that particular staircase again. The shotgun is pretty good. Ammo for it's a little sparse compared to like handgun ammo or bowgun bolts, but it's still absurdly useful and can still instant kill basically every normal zombie. It's pretty good. <laughs> Long time no see, Chris. Wesker? He's still alive? <laughs> what are you doing here? I came for Alexia. Who? An organization hired me to capture her. Wait! You attacked the island! And my sister! I hate you. You destroyed my plans. So now I've sold my soul to a new organization. Now die. Here's a little secret, Chris. I figured out that your sister is now in the Antarctic. With Alexia. It's too bad you won't be seeing her again. <laughs> Alexia? <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, just ignore this Bandersnatch. You'd be quick to kill, but I think it's also the last Bandersnatch in the game, and while it might make one last desperate try to grab you like that, it's not worth fighting or wasting the ammo on. Now that we have the turntable key, our goal is to get over back here and use it. This is going to take us upwards a couple floors of memory serves. Uh, if I recall correctly, it takes us to the hallway near the entrance of the military uh, training facility. But before we actively do that, you might notice now there's some boxes on the turntable we can move. And that allows us to get uh, an item I actually frequently missed on my early playthroughs. There's a box of uh, bow gun powder right there on top where the submachine gun ammo once was. Honestly, upgrade for us. Because the submachine guns are extremely useful in their own right, but bow gun powder is just boss destroying, honestly. With that said, the reason I'm mostly starting to use the submachine guns now and not from the moment I initially got them, it's mostly because the hunters have spawned. Uh, as while the submachine gun is very effective against zombies, it stuns and combos hunters down on the ground like no business. They basically can't touch you if you're using them. The big problem therein is if you don't attack, if you don't activate the seekers, you're not going to be activating many hunters. But it's still worth using just for the random fodder zombies. Especially until you get more shotgun ammo, just so you can save up on that. But yeah, the shotgun is still a really good gun against boss fights or zombies. Hell, with the amount of grenade launcher ammo this game has on top of some other things, I'd argue that the shotgun is better used on hunters and zombies than anything else. 
It's still effectively an instant kill on basically anything that you get a pure headshot on, namely the zombies. The biggest disappointment with it is actually partially a side effect, I believe, of the same reason that hunters seem a bit weaker in this game. As well, hunters still have their instant kill, like I brought up when they first showed up, I believe. There's no decapitating in this game whatsoever. Uh, hunters can't cut your head off, and you can't take zombies' heads off with the magnum or uh, shotguns. The sound effect from the original trilogy still plays, but there's just some blood that scatters and they fall down completely intact. I want to say this is due to some safety or anti-violence laws in Japan that prohibit certain things and under certain ratings from happening and all that jazz. It's a breaker for the ventilation device. Raise the lever. The reason we had to raise that lever is why I didn't come into this room earlier in the Chris scenario. We tried to come into this room, which is where Steve went nuts with his submachine guns after getting them. Uh, the toxic gas that we saw billowing out of that pipe as Claire had now completely flooded the room, and you really couldn't enter here without, I believe, either taking damage or just not going beyond a certain part of it. But now that we have got rid of that, we can explore further. But yeah, that, I believe that same set of laws, assuming I'm correct on why that's the way it is in this game, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, please, uh, is the same reason why, to this day, Resident Evil gets a slightly more censored version in certain territories, including Japan. Uh, I'm especially thinking of Resident Evil 7 and 8, like the shovel to the head in 7, and what happens to Ethan's hand several times in 8, uh, is just completely absent visually. Uh, from their Japanese incarnations. Although I think that also has to do with some games getting two versions in Japan, a more hardcore, gory version, and a version for teenagers. Here's the Clement Alpha. We already have the Clement Sigma, so we can now combine that to get the Clement Mixture. Now all we need is the Eagle Plate, and we're good to go. It's a work desk. Various tools are placed on it. I can modify my Glock 17 here. Want to do that? Yes, we do. So this changes... Uh, Chris's Glock 17 into his custom handgun, the Enhanced Handgun. Visually, it's not too different. I think its character model changes the uh, changes in literally no ways. And I don't think it has a ammo increase. But what it instead now does is I believe it has a slight rate of fire increase, has a slight power increase, and I want to say, I'm looking up right now to see if I'm right on this, it has a chance of doing a, a super shot of sorts. Yes, it can pierce through enemies now. Uh, and I think it has a completely different shot effect when it does that. Like, there's a bit more of an explosion to the shot. And I want to say it does a lot more damage when it pierces through enemies, too. Like, it's a guarantee, like, instant kill, maybe, on the first zombie or something like that. Or at least does a lot more damage. It's not super worth it, but it's so easy to get, you might as well get it anyway. You know what I mean? Compared to Claire's custom handgun, it is definitely the lesser of the two. But given that Chris gets access to a lot more weapons otherwise, oh well. And theoretically, you could give Chris Claire's custom handgun by just putting it into the item box anyway. So, eh. Admittedly, that takes forethought and knowing that that isn't that the entire Chris scenario is coming, but uh, oh well. Which kind of cements my thoughts on Code Veronica in a way in that I think on a first time blind run... I think Code Veronica is the hardest classic Resident Evil besides maybe Zero. Uh, as with the amount of, not gotcha moments, but times where you could get screwed over by not knowing what's coming ahead of you between certain enemies, losing certain weapons or items, or the entire switch to Chris period, it's very easy to just lose out on ammo items or just lose access to some very key weapons. Like, you could theoretically have every weapon on Claire going into the Nosferatu fight, and you would have to uh, just only have Chris with a handgun. Although now that I think about it, I think you are able to go back to the item box when you're supposed to grab the sniper rifle as Claire, because I think you need to grab the sniper rifle in order to access that fight anyway. So I guess you would need at least two ammo, uh, two inventory slots open, but still, you can still put most of Claire's weapons in there. Eventually, that empty extinguisher will come into play. With that said now, we are back towards where the Hercules plane took off, and this is very key because we need to get those proofs back.
Now, there's a couple of extra items you can go for in this section that I just don't. Like, I think there might be... Don't quote me on this. I think there might now be an herb in the section where you get off of the submarine. And I know there's a thing of shotgun ammo. I just completely ignore going for. Uh, the main reason for that is I just don't care. Uh... As Chris, with the amount of weapons I have now, I feel I'm very comfortable with ammo and never need to really worry about it. In fact, again, you could use a lot more handgun ammo than I am in this LP, and you will probably be fine, because I have way too much of it by the end of the game. With that said, in order to actually access the proofs, we need to lower this bridge again, so let's just pull the lever again. There's lever. Lower it. Yep. The oil pressure of the bridge has gone down. I can't operate it now. Well, shit. We need to get the oil pressure back to normal in order to even get close to the proofs. And this leads us to what I think is the hardest puzzle in the game. If I were to equate this to something, it's sort of close to, like, the uh, power level puzzles in Resident Evil 2 and 3. But it's a lot more annoying. The oil pressure. The automatic control device is out of order. It must be operated manually. There's a notice. Read it. Manual operation. 1. Supply oil to t the 10 liter tank using 3 cylinders. The standard oil amount must be maintained. If the oil isn't at the standard amount of 7 liters, the device will not activate. Be careful. So the way this works is we have to use various combinations of 3 and 5 liters of oil to reach 7. In the case that a oil thing on the top is completely emptied, it will refill. If you fill it up to the maximum of 10 on the bottom, though, whatever is left as surplus will remain in the tank. So you can, say, press 3 three times to get it up to 10. Or no, four times to get it up to 10. Flush it with the bottom thing on the bottom, and then just press it again three more times to get it up to 7. This is sort of the equivalent to certain puzzles in the original Layton games. And it's an out-of-nowhere brain teaser in this game, I feel, because it's the only time they get this kind of picky with puzzles, I feel. Oh no, three zombies. Whatever will I do? There's a door right here. Oh no. <laughs> That's where the box of shotgun shells is, by the way, that I completely ignored. You saw it in that cutscene. It was right below the guy in the middle. Now, we're coming up on kind of a tricky part of the game, technically. That can be a lot more annoying depending on when you went to see that cutscene with Wesker earlier this video. In that, after Wesker has met Chris officially, certain zombies get changed up a bit. There's now more zombies, I think, that are meant to be part of his uh, recon brigade or something like that. And I think they're also the main zombies you fight in the battle game. But now some zombies are going to have bombs on them. And if you shoot them when you're next to them, they explode. And that means some cheap damage. The zombie itself isn't always necessarily killed by the explosion either, so you need to be a bit careful. Also, I think this hunter right here is the exact reason I always think that this particular bridge has a bandersnatch during the Claire scenario. So, uh, whoops. Oh no, I'm in danger. Uh, Resident Evil Code Veronica does bring back the limping when you're low enough on health from Resident Evil 2, but you're nowhere near as slow as you were in Resi 2. Uh, I, I know some people don't like that. I don't mind it myself because it's kind of a punishment for not being better with managing your health. And there's the explosions. Uh, you can always tell whether or not a zombie is going to explode by whether or not they have a box on your back. And if you come back into the room after exploding the explosive, sometimes it respawns. So be careful. Otherwise, you might take some dumb damage. Now we're back where Claire and Steve boarded the... Uh, the Hercules. And this is also where Wesker released the Hunters from, so of course there's a Hunter right here. But the main reason we're here is for the proofs right there, which are looking a little zappy. This device supplies electricity to the lift. Cut off the electricity. So now we can grab all three proofs and take them back to the painting room in order to use them for their final use. Kind of annoying thing, you need to make sure you have at least three inventory slots for this, but... 
honestly, since even on a first playthrough, you probably at this point know that you need those proofs for something, you're probably going to grab them anyway and have the inventory slots prepped. I do find, in general, times like this where you can find the keyhole almost guaranteed first before you find the keys, so to speak. If you know where the key's going to be ahead of time, like in cases like the proof, you're going to know exactly how many inventory slots you need. Uh, Code Veronica probably is the most common place with doing that, though, as uh, the original trilogy and Zero tend to just kind of throw you in and hope that you just have enough exper uh, have enough inventory slots to grab something, otherwise you'll have to backtrack. Which admittedly is like part of the whole thing with the survival horror genre. You don't know exactly what you're going to need in certain cases, especially when inventory management is focused, like in Resident Evil. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part 13, we're going to continue exploring the military training facility with Chris, and hopefully getting closer to our escape in the process. See you guys then.